Good evening. Thank you for coming. You know, we got all these clergy people together to make it rain. Is it so rainy? Thank you all, by the way. We figured it would take uh, another 25 years to get rain, so here we go. My name's Tony Klein. I thank you for coming. Uh, I am and been honored to be the chairman for the steering committee for 175th. We've been working at this for six years. It was supposed to be five, but you know what happened last year. But I thank you for coming. It's so important that we start this weekend off with the clergy. As you well know, the first main building in Fredericksburg, Varines Care, and all the clergy people uh, did their services there. So it's right in its place to start this off this year. I want to just tell you that in the back of, of the auditorium is the book for the 175th year, and they're free. And on your way out, if you want to get those, we would appreciate it. So let us begin. Thank you. Here we are, the people of Fredericksburg, Texas, together. Together in community. Together to worship. Together to remember, to celebrate, and to give thanks. The year was 1846, when two peoples first together came to this land called Texas, the people, or Numerinu, also called Comanches. They were already here. Then came the Germans, the Deutschen. They settled at a place between two creeks four miles north of the Perdinalis River. They named the settlement Fredericksburg. The people and the Germans made peace. Others then came from different places, some speaking different languages, others living shaped lives by different cultures. Some worshiped differently, some worshiped not at all. In their diversity, they formed community. But from year to year, generation to generation, in every circumstance, God was with us, creating, saving, sustaining. And even now, God is with us, creating, saving, sustaining. And God is ahead of us, calling us forward, leading us on, and promising us new challenges, new opportunities, new experiences of God, creating, saving, sustaining. So let us, the people, let us give thanks as we join together responsively in the call to worship from Psalm 105 invite you to please stand as you are able. Sing to God, sing praises to the Lord. Dwell on all his wondrous works. Pursue the Lord with his strength, seeking his face always. You who are the offspring of Abraham, his servant, and the children of Jacob, his chosen ones. The Lord is our God. His justice is everywhere. God remembers his covenant forever, the words he commanded to a thousand generations. God set it up as a binding law for Jacob an eternal covenant for Israel, promising, We sing the processional hymn, O God our help in ages past. <laughs>
Nami Sutai Usuni Summa Oye Dunata Duma Na Wobusi. We thank you for the good heritage you have given us. Der eine Vergangenheit, die uns eine längere Perspektive gibt als unsere eigenen Erfahrungen. Para un presente lleno de sabiduría y oportunidades. Si bueno, chao, no supa, no lo supe. Cause us to walk in beauty. Geben Sie uns Augen, um jemals den rotlilen Sonnenuntergang zu sehen. Que nos haga sabio para entender y conocer todo lo que nos has enseñado. Si quiero, más suerte. Nada suerte, era tener Turkey, Turkey, Turkey. Make us always ready to come to you with clean hands and steady eyes. Then also does Leben für diese Generation verblasst. Wie der verblassende Sonnenuntergang. Tu luz brillará de nuevo sobre las generaciones futuras para guiar en el camino que debemos seguir. Amen. 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 We lift our voices in praise and worship to the everlasting God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Through the years, He's been our solid rock, our cornerstone. He's been our way maker, our promise keeper. And He's brought us light through the darkness around us. So, just as those pioneers' dad did so many years ago, and, who, and all those who followed Him, let's join together and let's lift our strongest worship to our everlasting God. Would you stand, please, as we sing?
is who you are. That is who you are. Amen. Please. In First John, it tells us that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So it's good that we come to God with penitent hearts, confess our sins, knowing that we are met with God's grace. Will you pray with me? Lord of mercy and compassion, we know that the, the nation whose God is the Lord is a blessed nation indeed. And yet we know that the nations in general and our own in particular have turned their backs on you who made us and redeemed us with the precious blood of your only begotten Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. We do confess that we fail miserably as we sought to live our lives apart from you. We've fallen deeper into moral decay and degenerated into a spiritual void that only you can lighten and heal. So by your amazing grace, convict us, Lord, both nationally and individually of our constant need to turn to you. For you alone are the true answer to our downward spiral. By the presence of your Holy Spirit tonight, do give us a glimpse of the kingdom that you are bringing to earth, where death and violence and hunger will be no more, and where all nations gather in the light of your presence. Teach us peace, that we may plow up battlefields and pound weapons into building tools, and learn to talk across old boundaries as brothers and sisters in your love. Do talk sense to us so that we may wisely end all prejudices and put a stop to injustice and cruelty which divides our wounds, the human family. And finally, may the resurrected Jesus, who forgives all our sins, draw us together as one people who do your will so that we might be a light to our nation, leading the way to your promised kingdom which is even now coming among us. Thank you so much for your faithful devotion to us, your people. Strengthen our faith that we might be devoted to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God's word from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 26, verses 1 through 11. When you have entered the land the Lord your God is giving you as inheritance and have taken possession of it and settled in it, take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as his dwelling for his name and say to the priest in office at the time, I declare today to the Lord your God that I've come to the land the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. The priest shall take the basket from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, Lord, have given me. Place the basket before the Lord your God and bow, before him, bow down before him. Then you and the Levites and the foreigners residing among you shall rejoice in all the good things of the Lord your God has given to you and your household. The reading is from the epistle of St. Paul to the Hebrews. Let us attend. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The Gospel Lesson from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I first met tonight's preacher, I think it was 1996, if I'm not mistaken. I was serving on the staff of what was then known as the Admiral Nimitz Museum. We know it today, of course, as the National Museum of the Pacific War. While I was at work in my office one weekday, in walked a gentleman who introduced himself as Gerald Hoover. He explained to me that he was starting a brand new organization in town called the Fredericksburg Theater Company. He then said that he was at the museum seeking help with his company's first production, the musical South Pacific. Y'all remember that? Some of you do. I thought to myself, well, Since this is the hometown of Admiral Nimitz, that sounds like a pretty good way to start. And indeed it was. That first meeting in the Nimitz Museum was the beginning of a friendship that has lasted for 25 years. Gerald and I have worshiped together, made music together, participated in funeral services together, talked over matters of faith together, discussed community needs together, and socialized with one another. It didn't take me long to recognize that Gerald Hoover is an immensely talented man with a deep inquisitive faith who knows how to serve others and the community in which he lives. Over the years of our friendship, I've learned some of the basic facts of Gerald's life. He was born and raised in the West Texas oil patch town of Odessa. He attended college and grad school at West Texas A&M. He went on to earn a Doctor of Musical Arts degree from the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He then served for 15 years in church ministry, mostly in Austin. As I've already noted, he founded the Fredericksburg Theater Company in 1997 and served as its managing and artistic director until 2021. He then served as Fredericksburg's mayor from 2006 to 2010, and again, a glutton for punishment, from 2012 to 2014. In 2015, Gerald became the executive director of the Gillespie County Historical Society and served in that capacity until 2021. Gerald, his wife, Ruth Ann, and their three sons became Fredericksburg residents in 1996, 
All three of their sons graduated from Fredericksburg High School. Two of them still live here with their families, including three grandchildren. Well, I don't know about you, but I can't wait to hear the word that the Spirit has given to our preacher to speak to us tonight as we praise God for this remarkable community in which we live. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to our preacher, Dr. Gerald Hoover. Thank you. I want to take one minute to express my deep and humble thanks and gratitude to the Gillespie County Ministerial Association for inviting me to do this 15 months ago. You recall we were going to do this this time last year. But that 15 months gave us an opportunity to get to know one another better. And during those months of preparation, I got to know four brothers very well, actually five, but in the ministry, Pastor Casey Zetch, Pastor Rick McMinn, Pastor Bobby Vitek, and Pastor, um, who am I forgetting? Bobby, Casey, Rick, Monty. Monty. Oh, yeah. He was that guy right here. And Lester Fronson. Any of those men could have taken this assignment. It's been 26 years since I've had a routine public assignment. And although I don't want to diminish any of the recognitions that I've received in this town, there's none higher than you could give me this spot in this pulpit on this occasion. Thank you. The title of my address tonight is Called to a Far Country. And the emphasis is on the word called. This is a word well known to every minister in the room. It carries the concept of getting a special assignment. We talk of ministers being called to the profession or called to a particular ministry or congregation, of course, meaning called by God. A calling is a revelation of God's will to an individual or a group to be something, to do something, or to go somewhere. We read of many callings in the Bible, to Noah, to build an ark to Abraham to leave home and start a new nation in a far country, to David to be king, to the prophets to speak for God. Jesus called disciples, and Paul was called to preach the gospel to Gentiles. The church is called to be a people committed to the risen Jesus as the Son of God, taking on his view of the kingdom of God on earth and voluntarily binding ourselves to each other in love to live in common purpose. A calling from God is serious. It directs one's path. It changes one's plans. It provides a clear motivation for doing something one might not ordinarily do. Or, in the case of the theme tonight, go where one might not otherwise go. One of the things we get clearly from reading the Bible cover to cover is this. Our God loves to insert himself in human affairs. We might even say he loves to meddle in our affairs. But no one is more entitled to meddle in our affairs. He created us. He knows fully ourselves. And as the psalmist says, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. His meddling is always with the purpose of leading us to our best, to lift us up to affirm our dignity as creatures carrying his image. His purpose is to elevate us, to seek his kingdom, and to give us what's best out of the riches of his character. We invite God to insert himself in our affairs every Sunday when we pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, if he's going to do that, he must have willing people who hear and obey his call. In the book of Jeremiah, he assures those who hear and obey his call that he has plans to prosper them, to protect them from harm, to give them hope and a future. And we can be fully confident 
that he who knows the number of hairs on our heads and proclaims his love for us will insert himself into our affairs always to our benefit and for his kingdom's purposes. Our loving God only ever wants our best. And if we have ears to hear, he will constantly guide us in the ways that are best and the good results of our obedience are assured. So 176 years ago, he called our founders to a far country. Except unlike Abraham, they knew the name of the place they were going, Texas. They left their homeland, which was then known as Prussia, but I'm going to refer to it as Germany because that is how their homeland is now known. They were to leave behind all their possessions except what they had on their backs and what they could fit into a trunk that was four feet long, two feet wide, and two feet deep. They left parents, brothers, sisters, and friends. They left their lives in the only land they'd ever known to come to a place they'd never seen with the intent of staying the rest of their lives. Why? In rational human terms, they looked around at the circumstances in which they lived and they saw constant political wars that forced them into military service, a government of nobles protecting each other's interests, the lack of land for even subsistence farming, and most inciting of all, the absence of freedom to rise above their circumstances, the lack of the opportunities for self-determination based on their own strengths, their own talents, their own tenacity. They saw no future for themselves and their families. So, they scraped together the money necessary to pay the immigration company for the cost of passage on a ship, transport from the coast of Texas inland to the land grant, and a prepayment for supplies they would need when they arrived. The process of getting from Germany to Texas was an ordeal requiring heroic courage. They were crammed into sailing ships for weeks. That was only the first part of the journey. Once they arrived, they were left on the Texas beach for more weeks, lacking food and shelter, facing the elements, including disease. Then they walked some road ox carts to New Braunfels, only to live more hard scrabble lives in temporary quarters with few supplies, not knowing when the day would come they would arrive at their destination. But arrive they did, finally, on May the 8th, 1846, what they came to was a beautiful yet forbidding wilderness frontier inhabited by dangerous animals and controlled by tribes of Native Americans who for centuries had used this area for subsistence hunting. From the moment they pulled their wagons into what is now the intersection of Maine and Washington streets, the survival clock started ticking, pushing them to build shelter and provide their own food. Many of them arrived with fewer loved ones than they left with. Along with physical, emotional, and spiritual weariness from the journey and dread over the arduous work still ahead of them to create habitable space, they also suffered deep heartbreak over the death of a spouse, a child, a sibling, or a parent. And they had to be wondering, what have we done? Why on earth would they do such a thing? Because they were answering a call to a far country. They believed this call was from someone they'd learned to trust, the God of their fathers. Their faith matched what the book of Hebrews described as being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. How do we know these were people of faith? Because they have left written records of their assurance they were responding to his call to a far country. They testify to trusting in his divine will. They write of the fervent prayers they made on behalf of a successful journey. And because one of the first things they did when they got here was build the Vereinskirche, 
which by its very name identifies it as a building, an altar, if you will, testifying to their faith in this one who called them to this far country. We know this because they formed congregations right away. The Sunday house is by its very name a testament to their faithfulness to attend worship. They came to town to do business on Saturday and stayed in their Sunday houses to be here when the church bell rang next morning. We know because we are here 176 years later remembering what they did and celebrating the benefits they created for us. The prophet Isaiah confirms the power of God's word, meaning his work, his guidance, his purposes, his meddling in our affairs. God says through Isaiah, my word will not return empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. When God calls and his people respond, the results are always profoundly correct. When he calls, he has the end already in hand. When he calls and his people obey, something good and lasting occurs. Does it strike you as unusual for a town founded seven generations ago to keep its origins precious in its collective memory? celebrating the details of that founding every 25 years and keeping it alive in many other ways every day, this is not the norm. Fredericksburg is what it is in this regard because generations before us instilled the importance of passing this on to this very day. Now, to be honest, were all these people who left the homeland to come to this far country full of vital faith and noble aspirations based on their trust in God? No, they weren't. No place has 100% of any kind of people, religiously or philosophically. And we have record of these people too. Surely many good-hearted, courageous, and free-thinking people and so on, they came looking for a place to be free from what they considered the intellectual constraints of religion. That's good for America. And it helps sharpen those of us with a vital faith to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks us for a reason for the hope that we have, as First Peter advised us, us. And there are those among us now who don't feel any special significance about our founding principles or the heroic heritage that we celebrate this weekend. But surely even they came here in large part due to the attraction of a community already built and sustained on the foundations of faith, family, freedom, and community. And they received the same benefits as the rest of us. I want to draw a parallel between the story of our German founders answering the call to this far country in the 1840s to the biblical story of Abraham, or Abram, as he was called at the time. In Genesis chapters 12 through 20, early 25, we read of God's meddling in Abram's affairs. His call to Abram was simply to go to where he was in Ur, which is in modern-day Iraq, to go to a far country. The Lord said to him, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. So there's the call. But the Lord sweetened it with this promise of reward for Abram's obedience. He said, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, the Lord called him to a far country, but he didn't specify which country. He just said, pack up and go where I lead you. Somehow, Abram at least got the direction or the idea of which direction to head, which was west in the direction of Canaan. But it wasn't until he arrived that the Lord said, this is it. To your offspring, I will give this land. Now, God's promise was so surefire that he changed his name from Abram, which means exalted father and could refer to any man with only one child, to Abraham, which means father of many. And the entire Old Testament is the story of God's fulfillment of his promise to Abraham to form a new nation whose descendants would multiply as stars in the sky and nations would be blessed by them. Oh, his people failed multiple times. But God, not once. The parallels are not perfect. 
Abraham was called to be the father of a new nation. Our founders were called to inject an old nation into a new one. Abraham's new nation fought violent with the, violently with those already in the land. Our founders were blessed with the diplomatic talents of John O. Moisebach, the openness of the native tribes, and their desire was to negotiate peacefully. And today, we continue to celebrate the moisebach Comanche Treaty as the only one unbroken between native and immigrant. Still, the impetus for God's will and work to be done to form a new nation from which would come the Christ began with his call to the pagan, Abram, to leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you, and many have been blessed. So 176 years after the founding of Fredericksburg, what is our calling today? To keep pushing forward through a risky ocean crossing, unaware of exactly what was waiting them in a strange land, contending with the harsh elements, losing loved ones to disease, negotiating a treaty with a powerful culture. They did all of this with faith in the one who called them and an eye toward his blessings on their posterity. Here we are seven generations later with that call still ringing in our ears. Now is our time to respond. We are not called to a far country. Our call is to uphold the foundations of the one we have. Our call is to hold in high honor those who established this place. Our founders knew they were planting trees they would never sit under. They had a long vision for what they wanted for their children and grandchildren. They came for a better life for themselves and to plow the fields for a new life of freedom and faith that would last for generations. Our call is to live in the strength of those values they brought and taught. Our call is to honor them by carrying on the example they set, to treat every person with dignity, to work together to solve our problems, to treat the stranger with compassion, to look out for one another, to honor our past while leaning into our future, to reap the rewards of hard and disciplined work, to celebrate our freedom as Americans, and to teach this faith and the way of life to our children and grandchildren. Our call is to be as bold as they were and remain true to who we are and why it matters. When God calls us to something, he provides the means. When God calls us to something, it's to fulfill his purpose. Our forefathers and mothers came here from a far country because they answered the call to make this a better country, a better state, a better part of the state, a better community. And their legacy has blessed all the generations that came after. And now it is our turn to pass it on to the next. May we walk in obedience to all that God has commanded so that we may live and prosper and prolong our days in the land he has given us. May we listen to his voice and hold fast for him. He is our life and he will give us many years in the land he has given us. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us nor forsake us. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us and establish the work of our hands for us. And may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Are you ready to sing? Please stand as you're able as we sing together the hymn, Forward Through the Ages.
vacate with several prayers and intercessions. We pray for our community. I'll be praying for the churches of our community. I'm going to start out of Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edges of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. In the Hebrew it's Lachayim, life forevermore. And then Proverbs 11.11. 11. This is one that's really near and dear to my heart. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. But it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked, which speaks to me that we should speak life always of our community, which is why we're gathered here today. Would you pray with me? Abba, Father, we are before you today, this evening, to celebrate 175 plus years as a community. And Lord, we thank you for the promise of your presence, the promise of your spirit when we are gathered together, that it is there where you command the blessing, L'chaim. And so, Father, we receive that blessing, even now, life forevermore. And, Father, we are of those who choose to speak life over our community, over our county, over our region, to be light bearers and life givers as we go throughout our week, as we do the dailies every day through our routine, whether it's walking in the marketplace or going to a store or working in our, out on the field or in an office or in the cab of our truck, Lord, we speak life and declare blessing over our community. And Father, we're grateful for the community of faith here in Fredericksburg and Gillespie County. Lord, what a great uh, unified group of pastors, ministers, leaders of faith-based organizations who come together on a regular basis to celebrate your goodness and your grace and your mercy toward us and to speak life over our community. And so, Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your blessing upon our community. And, Lord, even as we're gathered tonight to celebrate, we declare Lachayim, life forevermore over our community. Lord, we pray for the churches of our community that all would prosper, all would grow, all would be filled to capacity and more, that multiple services would happen because so many are hungry for you. And so, Lord, as we speak and declare and decree the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord, I thank you that we are a community of faith. It is not uncommon to be in a in, a, in an establishment here, in a coffee house, or, or another place where we see Bibles open and people talking openly of their faith. And we are grateful for that. Thank you, Lord, that as we dwell together in unity, as we sing praises to you, as we worship you, your word says that you inhabit, you dwell in, you are seated among the praises of your people. And Lord, even in this place tonight, you are here among us and we welcome you your presence, your spirit, to be at home with us, your people. And Father, even as we go from this place, as we move out into our daily lives, Lord, we choose by faith and on purpose and with purpose to carry your grace with us everywhere we go, to build bridges of life and hope with those that we meet on a daily basis, where we live, where we work, and where we play. So, Lord, we honor you and we welcome you. And, Lord, may we as a community continue to be a blessing to you as well as to one another. We honor you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. For our community itself and those who serve it, let us pray. O oh, Father, you have created humankind in your image an image of love, and formed us into families, communities, villages, and cities that we may live in the way of love, serve one another, and learn from one another in the vast array of human personality, gifts, and callings. 
Thank you for the loveliness and intricacy of human diversity and for the particular gift of what the Fredericksburg community is and has become in 175 years of shared life and work. You make community in a complex web of relationships, a web which knows the constant threat of disintegration as well as the steadying force of years of commitment and wisdom. We pray that you may guide us as a community, that we may stand as one in a commitment to love and serve our neighbors as ourselves, as you have taught us. We pray also for all those who work in helping and healing organizations here, that in their works of self-sacrifice, they may know courage, strength, and joy of heart to accomplish the vision of a community marked by charity and well-being. And may you, through them, inspire such acts of kindness in all who live and visit here that in future years as in the past, Fredericksburg may be known by its values of compassion, pride in service, and selfless love. Lead us, O God, who delights in us when your people live and dwell together in unity, when your people love as you have loved us. Amen. Pray for the needy, the hungry, the abused. Let us pray. God of kindness and mercy, as we are celebrating 175 years of our settlement in this town, we thank you for being kind and merciful to us and assisting us in our temporal and spiritual necessities. Today, with faith and trust, we pray for all those that are in need in this town, in this country, in the world, especially the hungry, the hurting, and those that have been abused physically, emotionally, and psychologically. As you help the chosen people of God in the past and their needs, and especially through Jesus who manifested your kindness and mercy to the needy, to the hungry, to the outcasts, sick, downtrodden sinners, and loved them, blessed them, gave them hope, fed them, forgave them and restored them to health and to grace and to wholesomeness, we ask you today to help us also for all the needy and the hungry that they may have sufficient bread for their physical life, that all that have been hurt physically, spiritually and mentally may get back their courage and confidence and face all the challenges with trust in you and enable all your children here to care for the less fortunate, the hungry ones, and be kind and charitable to all those that are in any need all the time. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Holy, mighty, and merciful God, we place all these matters that we have brought to the forefront in your hands. All that we love and hold dear, our nation, our heritage, our town, our churches and institutions, our families and friends. We commend them all to you, Holy Father. We thank you for the blessings you so generously rain down on us. We ask you to help us use them to further your kingdom and to improve the lives and welfare of all your people. Protect us from faithless fears and worldly anxieties, knowing that you know us better than we know ourselves. Let no clouds hide from us the light of your eternal love for us, shown in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, knowing only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us all life long. All of this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Would you please stand as you are able for the act of commitment? From generation to generation, throughout the history of our community, God was with us. In this present moment, with its blessings and challenges, God is with us still. And God is ahead of us, still sounding the ancient call to live together in peace in a community shaped by the Spirit of God, creating a new and faithful history that will outlive us all to influence generations yet unborn. Living into God's future, this is our commitment. To love, love one another, another, encourage one another, another teach one another, care, care for one another, serve one another, comfort one another, forgive one another, pray for one another, bear with one another, welcome one another, minister to one another, and live in peace with one another. May God be praised. Please be seated. Just a quick note before we begin, our soloists were left out of the program. We have Amy Voorhees singing soprano, Trisha Eiler singing alto, Timothy Riley singing tenor, and Jim Wilhite singing bass. Thank you. Okay. 
Oh, y'all can do better than that. Give me a bigger amen. All right. Before I send us forth with a blessing, I want to thank God for every single person who made tonight's service possible, including all of you. Thank you. And now for a word of instruction. The pastors and other participants in tonight's service, seated in the auditorium to my right, will lead us forth from this place of worship into the world. As the brass ensemble plays, the clergy and leaders will exit first to be followed by the congregation. And now I invite you to stand to receive a blessing. Dearly beloved, remember who you are and what God has done from generation to generation in this community and beyond. Then look ahead and don't be afraid for the future is in God's hands. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you all this day and forevermore. Go in peace. Amen.